Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Tim, I'm not like, very glad to be here. Um, my date of sobriety is the 24th of July, 1993. Uh, my home group uh, is uh, the, uh, it's, it's a group in San Antonio called Group 12. Uh, uh, it's held at Club 12 in San Antonio, and I attend the morning meetings there, which is lunchtime here. There's a story behind that. Maybe I'll tell the story, but that's my that's my home group at the moment. Um, I'm here to talk about step 12. Uh, but of course, of course, it says in step 12, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, I'm going to need to talk about the other 11 steps or what I'm going to say about step 12 will not make any sense. There are also some people in their early days, and it never hurts to explain what alcoholism is. Because you never know what people know. I myself was, was very confused about what alcoholism was for many years it, 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 in AA. It's not self-evident that someone who's been going to AA even for years has a clear idea of what alcoholism is. Uh, because there are so many different views expressed in AA meetings, uh, it's possible to hear the truth, but it's lost in so much other material, one doesn't know one's heard it. My understanding of my alcoholism is, is uh, directly from the big book, and this is my, this is my take of, of how I understand my story through the lens of what the big book says. Uh, the first feature of it in step one is that when I drink, I'm off to the races. I drink buckets. That's simply what I do. I'm built like it. Uh, if you do that, horrible consequences will accumulate. You have two options. Uh, let it kill you or stop altogether. If you can't moderate like me, you have to stop altogether. Except, except, I have a little little voice in my head, in one part of my brain, which says, a drink is a good idea. Now, after the first time I had bad consequences, 1986, that little voice should have been shut down because very clearly drink was not a good idea. But that, that little voice is completely impervious to experience. It does not matter what I lose, how much I drink, what I do when I'm drunk, who I lose out of my life, if I'm arrested, if I'm charged, how long I spend in the cells, what danger I put myself in. That little voice is just programmed to say a drink is a good idea. That is my problem. Now, the problem that that little voice was connected to the controller at the front of my brain, which decides what we all go and do. If I could just if I could keep that voice under control, I'd be fine. But on my own, I can't because it just scoots straight past, grabs the steering wheel off to the pub. So I need to be not not in charge. If I am in charge of the course of my day, if I'm in charge of the course of my life, one day that little voice will come and say, let's have a drink. And I will have a drink. Why? Because I'm in the habit of doing what my brain tells me to do. If I'm in the habit of doing something else, I'm going to be OK. And the thing that I'm in the habit of doing, the something else which I'm in the habit of doing is uh, I call it the four P's, the program. 12-step program. Number two, the principles of the program. If in doubt, uh, love and tolerance of others. Be useful. Um, so not, not the first thing that comes into my head, but the program, the principles, the power, the higher power. I have access to a power greater than myself today, which I can contact directly uh, through prayer. Very simple. You just ask. You say, Hello, higher power, please help me. It doesn't need to be more elaborate than that. Uh, and lastly, the people. If in doubt, find someone who is smart and competent and sober longer than you, who you trust and say, I'm nuts today. What do you think I should do? I've never done that and come to more grief than I have by following my own best advice. 
So those four elements, that's what I trust instead, the program, the principles, the people, and the power. Um, uh, all step two says for me is that little system works. What step three says to me is, uh, buddy, do you want to pick up that system and live with it? The answer is yes. That's how I'm going to live instead. Uh, since I adopted that way of life, 24th of July, 1993, I haven't had a joke. So we know it works. <laughs> okay. We know it works. Why? Because we see people around us for whom it's working. Um, steps four through nine. The purpose of step four is not to analyze myself. It's to disclose uh, the tools of my trade. What are the tools of my trade? I can't control you. I can't control the truth. I can't control the world. I can't control how I feel. What I do have power over is my beliefs, my thinking, and my behavior. And it's the wrong exercise of those choices that that's what my step four is about. Where are my beliefs wrong? Where is my thinking wrong? Where is my behavior wrong? So I can fix it? No. So I can discard it and adopt an entirely new set of beliefs, thinking, behavior, which works. How do I know? Because I look at my friends around me in AA and it's working for them, so it will work for me. Step five, convey all the secrets. Uh, step six, you know, as I look, as I gesture in general towards my past, I say, do I want to stay like that? It's a yes, no question. I don't fuss around in step six very greatly. Um, either I want to, there are two systems. There's the ego system, there's the God system, or maybe you could call it the self system and the God system. And it says pretty clearly in the big book on page, um, what is it, page 60, the first requirement is that we be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. Before I've even done step four, I need to be convinced that my life run on base, based on what I think will make me happy is not going to make me happy. It's not going to work. The most amazing line in the big book on page 61, is he not a victim of the delusion that he can wrest happiness and satisfaction out of this world if he only manages well? And put in English, that means if I think running around doing what I want to do is going to make me happy, I'm deluded. I am wrong. The system has failed. Very simply, the system has failed. In my 30s, someone said to me, are you happy? And in my early 30s, and I, 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 I fussed around with the answer. I, I, I hemmed and hawed and I ummed and I ahed. Uh, and eventually I said, no, I mean, lots of things were better than when I got sober, blah, blah, blah. But essentially there were some problems in my life and because of those problems, I was unhappy. And the person said to me, so you've been trying to be happy for the last 30 odd years and you're not happy. When did you think your plan was going to kick in? And that hit me hard. If you've been applying a plan for 30 years or 40 years or 50 years and it hasn't worked, it's not going to work. OK, better just ditch it. Oh, it's so simple. I missed it anyway. Back to the secret, step seven. Step seven, to me, is, is a deeper commitment to the remaining five steps. How do my character defects go? Is it me or is it God? If it were all God, there wouldn't be another five steps. Um, how does this square with step seven as it's written in the book? Well, the direction on how to do the last five steps, where does that come from? God. The power to do the last five steps, where does that come from? God. I have to take the initiative. I have to be willing. I have to put in the action. But God is behind it the whole way. Plus, plus, in my experience, the higher power does an awful lot of fancy footwork below the surface. Uh, just one example. Uh, I did not know that um, I can't control the thought that comes into my mind, but I can control how long I think about it. I can redirect my attention. What I've discovered, if I do my bit, if I consistently redirect my attention away, say, from a fear or a resentment or a fantasy or whatever, eventually the urge goes away. 
I can't make the urge go away. I've got to do my bit. I've got to keep turning back to the present, turning back to the higher power, turning back to being useful. And then some kind of magic happens below the surface. I am not the person I was when I came in to recovery. I am the person I was when I came into recovery as well. I'm still the same entity, the same spirit, the same human being, but boy, is my life different. Um, I was, you know, today, I, I won't go on about my external life hugely at this point, uh, but uh, shall we say it functions very, very well, thank you. I would not swap my life for anyone else's. When I came into AA, I was broke. I had no occupation. I had no friends. I was estranged from my family. I was, I don't know how many pounds underweight. Um, I didn't really know how to do any ordinary everyday things. I was good at Latin and that was kind of it. Um, I, oh, and I was mentally ill in some alarming, distressing and attention grabbing ways. Um, all of that has cleared up over the years. Um, what else do we need to know? Uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, and then we're on 12. Uh, so step, uh, steps 8 and 9. Uh, when I finished the last amend I was capable of making, the lights went on, and I realized the lights had been off for a very long time because I'd been building up this roster of unamended harms. Healthy people clear up as they go along. I didn't. I had to do a, a step eight and nine to clear out the past. Note, it was the last amend which turned the lights on. The light, lights did not come on gradually. They came on all at once when the last amend was made. My friend promised me when these things were done in Bill's story. Um, I paid all the money back with interest. Um, not telling you to, that's what I did. And that's the result that I got. Um, 10, 11, and 12. Now, 10, 11, and 12, this is where it gets uh, to the top. Of. Um, when I take step three, I'm engaging in two systems. System number one, steps four through nine. That's a big arc which can take weeks or months. Sometimes people take longer over it, I don't. And the job of that is to clear up my life in a structural sense, um, to clear up the past, to look deep at stuff. But then the second system I'm engaging with is the daily system of 10, 11, and 12. And um, uh, they, they work together as a set. And I was encouraged by Maureen, who is a Wimbledon housewife. I saw lots of helping professionals before I got to AA. And the person that helped me more than all of the helping professionals, who I'm sure were great, but people not like me. The person that helped me more than the helping professionals was a housewife from Wimbledon. Um, this is the wonderful thing about AA. You never know who's going to be helpful. And uh, she got me doing, uh, she wasn't my sponsor, not formally, uh, but she got me doing steps 10, 11 and 12 right from the beginning. Uh, she got me taking an interest in service, taking an interest in being useful to other people right from the start. She got me doing steps 10 and 11 right from the start. As soon as I was committed to this way of life, she said, well, you're prepared. If you're sober a few weeks longer than someone else, then you're capable of helping them. Uh, you can't be everything for them, but you're capable of helping them. So go and help them. Um, her attitude, and it's one that I adopt, is basically the program boils down to stop thinking about yourself. Go and help. Go, go, go and help someone. Go and do something useful. There was a cartoon I saw of a giraffe drinking a cup of coffee. Now, you don't often see a giraffe drinking a cup of coffee, but on this cartoon, there was indeed a giraffe drinking a cup of coffee. And it said, have you ever thought that when a giraffe drinks a cup of coffee, by the time the coffee reaches its stomach, it's already cold? Of course you don't. You think only ever of yourself. And that was my problem. All I thought about was myself. And steps 10, 11, and 12 is the antidote. I start off in the morning. 
God, please direct my thinking. Why? My friend Brendan says this is a, uh, a preemptive strike against the devil. He likes the medieval terminology. Preemptive strike against self, against the ego, against whatever. God, please direct my thinking. There are days, not many, but there are days when I say that a hundred times. Uh, because I need to. If it works, do it. <laughs> if it doesn't work, don't worry about it. Another great principle. Uh, God, please direct my thinking. And I ask God to uh, guide my uh, day. Uh, what am I going to do today? And I, I need to do three things. Number one, I need to keep the show on the road. I need to put my own oxygen mask on first before I can be of maximum service to other people. Uh, but that, that doesn't take a lot. A few basic things structured into my day takes care of that. At the end of the day, there's a time when I clock off um, and I allow myself to just relax and do whatever. But between those two times, I'm on duty. I'm showing up for duty. It is not my life. The, the most remarkable thing is you can write something in absolutely plain English in the big book, and it will be wholly misunderstood by whole rafts of alcoholics. And, and people say that, well, it's a very old fashioned book, but the book is not stuttering when it says we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to, over to, over to God, the care and direction of God. And it's very clear on page 63 that my job is to stay close to God and perform his work well. Uh, so, it, and it's not archaic language. The step three prayer may be archaic, but the idea is plain. And yet I did this for years. Even after step three, I would, I would talk about my life. It's not my life. I've just turned it over to God. What do I mean my life? What I did with my life was the reason I needed to be in recovery. This is exhibit A, <laughs> okay? Um, I don't want my life back. The point of giving it to God is that God will, the higher power, whatever you conceive of it, even good orderly direction is better than what I came up with on my own. How, one, how I conceive of the higher power, neither here nor there, it's changed over time. It changes daily. It's not my life. So it's like working for Goldman Sachs. Uh, when you work for Goldman Sachs, I'm told they own you. Uh, uh, God's a bit like that, except uh, maybe a little bit more benevolent than, than certain uh, worldly employers. So I, I get look, I've got to look after myself. And when I look after myself, I get looked after. I need to be on duty during the day and then I get to play. I get to, uh, if I'm not enjoying the world, I'm missing something. The great Don P would say we're on God's amusement park planet. We better act like it. And so there's plenty I enjoy in my life. I haven't got enough hours in the day to do the things I enjoy. Step 11 in the morning is planning for the day. Meditation in the big book is concentrated thought. Um, it also says in a footnote on page 87, we're going to, you know, we find some useful books, read them, do what it says. And some people read some books and go to some classes and do transcendental meditation or Eastern philosophies or whatever. If that floats your boat, fine. But uh, the meditation in the big book is constructive thinking along specific lines. What are the specific lines? What does God want me to do today? Where does God want me to go? What does God want me to say to whom? What spirit? do I bring to each of those activities? That's it. That's it. And uh, it, it is that that takes my focus off myself. Someone said to me once, go into the corner and count yourself and then come back. And I came back. I said, there's one of me. And he said, there are 7 billion other people on the planet. I think they deserve more of your attention than you're giving yourself. My, I do, of course, I need to look after myself. But the best thing I can do for myself is to be useful in the world. My friend Dan says that usefulness is the greatest antidepressant. So go through the day using step 10, pages 84, 85. It's, it's adjusting the steering wheel. It's listening out for where the car is hitting the rumble strips in the center reservation. 
Uh, and when I can feel that I'm on the rumble strips, I, I steer back. At the end of the day, debrief what went well, what went badly. Say to the higher power, what do I do, what do, I do tomorrow? What do I need to discuss? But step 12 is the content. The structure is provided by steps 10 and 11. Step 12 provides the content content having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps i'm going to talk a little bit about the spiritual awakening uh, it, it boils down to a very very simple idea i thought i was my body now that sounds like a very curious thing to say but have you ever noticed that when someone makes a comment about what you look like you feel like they're talking about you if you know have you ever felt good because someone complimented you on how you looked or bad because someone didn't compliment you on how you looked or criticize how you looked. I did because I mistook myself for my body. That's an easy mistake to make. What I really am is consciousness. And it's, but it's worse than that. It's not just my body. Um, uh, my friend Mel, she made a, a lot of amends. Mel was like me. She was cool. You wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of her drunk. And anyway, one of her one of her amends, she'd she'd poured vinegar on this girl's sofa, and she'd poured vinegar on it and ruined it. Um, and she made amends, and the girl said back to her, "I can't believe you did that to me." Now that's a perfectly ordinary thing to say, and I thought about it afterwards. That's what she said back to me. I thought about it. I can't believe you did that to me. Oh my God, she's literally confused herself with a sofa. If you do something to the sofa, you're doing something to her. But then what's the difference between that when I do a piece of work at work and someone doesn't like it and I feel hurt by it? I've mistaken myself for the piece of work that I've done. If I believe a particular thing and someone on Facebook criticizes this idea or this value and I feel attacked, I've mistaken myself for that value. Now, if you go through life mistaking yourself for all sorts of things which are not you, no wonder a person becomes confused and upset. Because me, I wasn't contained inside myself. I was spread everywhere, all over my life, all over the world. If I have a value, anyone in the world who attacks a value, it feels like they're attacking me and I go on the defensive. Um, Someone went to a, a rabbi and said, um, everyone's always treading all over my, they're, they're treading all over me. They're always treading on my toes. And the rabbi said to him, that's because you're taking up too much space. Take up less space. There's less of you to tread on. The spiritual awakening is the recognition for me that people construe this in all sorts of different ways. I am not my body. I am not my sex, my gender, my sexual orientation, my ethnicity, my social background, my bank balance, my assets, my job, my qualifications, my appearance, my physical capabilities, all that. I'm none of those things. Those are garments. They're instruments to be used. That's it. They're, they're not, not there, but they're not me. So what am I then? What am I? Consciousness. I am the thing that is observing those things. Now, that sounds a little bit abstract and not very useful until you realize consciousness can't be hurt. My consciousness has never been hurt. My feelings have been hurt, but my capacity for awareness has never been hurt by anyone. Can't be taken away. If I can't be hurt, there is nothing to fear. So my identity is consciousness. Some people say spirit. Some people say children of God. If God is spirit and I'm a child of God, I'm spirit too. If you get a puppy, the puppy is also a dog. It's just a small version of one. Um, if God is spirit and I'm a child of God, I'm spirit too. So that's my identity. Uh, what about my value? Um, if you ever see uh, a bunch of kids from primary school or if you're in the States, elementary school on some kind of school trip to a museum, all holding hands in pairs, it's self-evident 
that these kids are each individually of incalcul incalculable infinite value. The notion that one might be worth more than another is grotesque. And one knows this instinctively. Oh, how differently one looks at adults. Um, when I had low self-worth, I was wrong. I didn't. No one ever told me that. I saw lots of professionals about this. When I said I had low self-worth, they sort of nodded at me. They, none of them said, did you know you're completely mistaken? You're just wrong. Your ability to assess your own value, you don't have any ability to assess your own value. That what they tried to do, what people tried to do, is point to things. You're good at this, so you should have value. But that's no good either. If my value lies in me being nice or good or accomplished, what happens on the days that I'm not? I'm making my value as a human being. I'm tying it to like a stock market index. My value has to be beyond the material world. So my value is infinite, as is, and this is the bad news, so is everyone else's, including you-know-who. You-know-who, everyone's got their own you-know-who. Their value is infinite too. That changes a few things. You may not want to have tea with them, but that's a different question. Um, so identity, value, and purpose. What is my purpose? Um, a friend of mine, I'm more a friend of his wife's. I'm not sure he's particularly keen on me, but I get on terribly well with his wife, who's got 50 years in, in 52 years now, I think, in Al Anon. Uh, what he says is, we're like these giant magnets which are dragged through the junkyard of life. And all of this rubbish gets stuck with, this metallic wreckage gets stuck. And we do the steps, and bit by bit, all of these pieces of wreckage just fall off us. And then we discover what we are. And I leant forward and said, we're lamps. We're meant to shine light. That's it. Another way of construing the same idea is my job is to wake up to the reality of this and help other people wake up. So I get to operate in the material world, but it's just where I happen to be right now. Um, Anne Lamott, um, who I recommend uh, for a bit of non-conference approved reading, she says, uh, death is a fairly significant change of address, which is my view today. So I can't be hurt. My body can be, but I'm not my body. My circumstances, my reputation can be hurt, but I can't. Once those questions of identity, value, and purpose are resolved, as my friend Tom says, it frees up the whole afternoon. You don't need to run around the world proving yourself. You don't need to walk on your knees a hundred miles in the desert repenting, as, as Mary Oliver says. There are, there are, uh, there, there's other stuff to be getting on with. And the other stuff is the rest of step 12. To, we try to carry this message to other alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. So the uh, absolute high octane, high energy, high impact work in my life is making myself available to other alcoholics uh, uh, with the program. That's kind of all we have to offer. There's a bit of, you know, uh, common sense life experience which gets conveyed along the way and that doesn't hurt and particularly I was very young when I got sober I was in my in my early 20s and I needed that because my family are about as useful as chocolate teapots when it came to advice and guidance and so on so I needed good sensible grown-ups in AA to to tell me in very important pieces of information like get a job I did not know that that's where money I just it, I, I didn't come to that realization that I needed to get a job to solve my money problems myself. I literally needed to be told. And then I didn't know how. So they told me where to go. If you go to this address at a certain time, 6.30 Monday morning, you queue up, you say, I would like to work. They will give you work. And I did. And they did.
It was amazing. So there is some common sense stuff that gets conveyed along the way, but the bulk of it is the program. Um, and I, I'm not going to mention other fellowships in great depth or in any depth at all, but I will say in passing, if you hang out with alcoholics and addicts for any length of time, an occasional Al-Anon meeting won't kill you. That's all I'm going to say about that. So I get to help people. I'm, I, I, I talk to people in some other fellowships too. Uh, and I've got sponsees in a number of different fellowships. Um, uh, I don't care if someone wants the program and we have a point of connection. Let's go for it. Let's see what happens. What's the worst that could happen? So um, there's a great line, and this is the test. Um, am I doing step 12 is the question. What's the test? Uh, page 19 of the big book. Most of us, that's members of Alcoholics Anonymous in this first hundred or so, uh, most of us spend much, that's a lot, much, um, <laughs> I ate much of the cake. That gives you an idea of what much is. There ain't much left. There's crumbs left. We spend much of our free time engaged in the kind of work we're going to describe. Um, that literally means I have to be spending much of my free time sponsoring other people. When you tell people this, like you were saying for a long time, they, they don't believe it. It says that. actually says that in the book. And so now what is free time? I have obligations. I have household obligations. I have a couple of jobs. I have my own business. I teach at a university. Um, what else? I've got a mother who is a thousand years old. She's in a home, but I look after all of her affairs. And we, you know, the, the, there's sometimes there's a lot of work there. Um, I, ha I have a, another relative in recovery and I have some obligations. They're not obligated, it's love but it's an obligation to things can be more than one thing. So there are lots of, of special duties in my life. Um, uh, my life needs to be, look, it, my life won't look after itself or the life that God has given me back in trusteeship um, needs looking after. The free time is when all of the obligations are discharged, what's left. And funnily enough, there's a lot left. 112 waking hours a week, maybe 40 at work. That leaves a lot of hours. Yeah, sure, some go on various obligations, but it's amazing. People don't think, people don't think it's going to be possible to spend a huge amount of time sponsoring and doing service. As soon as you're willing, it's possible. And I'll give you a good example of this. Now, uh, especially for the past 17 years or 17, 18 years or so, I've done an awful lot in AA. I did in the first few years, there was a couple of years where there was a gap. I didn't do very much at all, went mad, came back, uh, didn't drink, but, you know, it wasn't pretty. Um, I'm mean, very, very busy in AA, and for, uh, I was a pianist when I was much, much younger, and I stopped playing for seven or eight years at one point, and I said to myself, I'm doing so much in my life, uh, I can't, I don't know how I could fit even half an hour a day in. And I did start playing again. And I don't know how it's possible that I play four or five hours on Saturday, four or five hours on Sunday, maybe an hour and a half every day during the week. And it hasn't, doesn't seem to, my income hasn't dropped and I'm not sponsoring any fewer people. There are so many things I've told myself in my life are impossible. And I put the situation in God's hands and say, well, over to you. You show me how to do this because I can't figure it out. I cannot figure out how all of this is going to get done. I don't have to, though. All I have to do is say to God, what shall I do today? That's it. What shall I do today? And everything gets done. So um, uh, sponsorship. I uh, sponsor a lot of people. Um, um, it's a number that would have. I would have found eye watering 15 years ago. Uh, it waters my eyes a bit now uh, when I think about it too hard. But here's the great thing. Um, 
when people say, how many people do you sponsor? My answer is one at a time. The person I'm sponsoring at that moment is the one that I'm on the phone to at that moment. When the phone goes down, I'm on to the next task. If I'm back at work, I'm back at work. Um, with very rare exceptions, uh, the ideal is uh, I should not be thinking about my sponsees except in the moment that I'm sponsoring them unless I'm asking God for specific guidance on how to handle a situation. And let me tell you, there are situations. And this is why it's very helpful to have a sponsor uh, uh, who has a sponsor who has a sponsor. So my sponsor is the uh, same length of sobriety as me, but older and much wiser and much cleverer. Um, he has a sponsor that's a billion years sober who has a sponsor who is a billion years sober, like 40 something 50 something um there is always someone in the network who knows how to handle whatever situation arises but my job as a sponsor uh, i'm not responsible for the sponsee um they take themselves through the steps i just show them how to do it that the energy must come from them my experience is that when I'm sponsoring a bunch of people, there'll be one or two who are taking 90% of my psychic energy. Uh, most of them, absolutely fine, it's just, it's just motors. But the ones that are taking my psychic energy, every single time it's because I'm trying to make up for a lack of impetus or energy on their side. There's a resistance there and I'm trying to fight the resistance. And I'm getting a lot better. I just, I just don't fight the resistance anymore. And I had a situation the other day, this was, this was priceless. The person said, lovely person, and we're, we're, we're working together very successfully at the moment. Um, they said, and they've been in recovery for a while. They said, I've got so many reservations. I said, oh, okay. Well, we're, we're, when you haven't got any, come back. And I thought, have I said the wrong thing? They didn't like that conversation at all. But the funny, I could have thought that. I know how to fight that. I know how to sit down and systematically go through every reservation, finding the perfect argument for each one. But it's not about that. You know that game in the street with the three cups and the pea, and they say, which cup is the pea under? You can't outwit, you can't outwit the people with that game. And it's just like that with, with sponsorship. When I feel I'm having to be ingenious or clever or convincing or persuasive i'm playing the wrong game anyway person in question came back a day later said i have no reservations now they're motoring i could have spent six months trying to work through those because here's the deal um when the solution is offered to me part of me hates it because the ego knows that if i have a spiritual awakening i'm going to go back to god and recognize that the ego and all of its all of its castles in the air are nothing the bloated nothingness of self it my ego is literally fighting for its life so it whispers in my ear all the reasons why i should not follow the instructions and suggestions i'm being given now, what I've got to do is figure out whose side am I on? Am I on my side or am I on its side? And the key is this. Who got me into this position that I need a spiritual awakening in the first place? It wasn't God. It must have been my ego. And here's the great piece of wisdom that someone gave me many years ago. <clears throat> it is impossible to make a decision without a guide. So my consciousness, it has to use a system to work out what to do, a set of values and the thinking system which goes with those values. The only two value systems available, the value system of the ego and the value system of God, the value system of God is love and acceptance and laughter. And the value system of the ego is specialness and me ahead of you and 
in for me, in for me. They've all got it in for me. This eternal competition between me and everyone else for that tiny bit of sunshine. And if if I if you get the sunshine, there won't be enough for me. So I've got to destroy you. And there are occasional alliances, but only when it's in my interests. Those are the two systems. Whenever I make a decision, I'm activating one of those two systems. But I can't make a decision without the system. So what I've learned to recognize is that voice which resists the program and God and the principles and, and whatever. That's the one that got me into trouble in the first place. I do not want to listen to it. When you bring the exterminator in to zap the cockroaches, you don't ask the cockroaches' opinion on the exterminator. They're not going to side with you against themselves. My ego will never co-sign its own destruction. But here's the funny thing. When I withdraw my allegiance to it, it has nothing to throw back at me. It can witter away like, you know, the demon that possesses people in exorcist films. But it can't do anything. It's powerless. As Glinda the Good Witch of the North says about the Wicked Witch of the West, be gone, you have no power here. And then when she's gone, she says, Pooh, what a smell of salt. Uh, my ego has no hands but mine. It can't do anything without my permission. If I say you're fired, it's fired. So that little battle, what I've learned with sponsorship, I mean, I could talk forever about sponsorship, but well, I spend so much time doing it, so I've got a lot of experience. But when someone's got this little battle inside themselves, which, which voice to listen to? If I weigh in too heavily on God's side, they'll take their own ego side. Happens every single time. So I want to stay out of that one. I said, well, if you want this, you can have it. If you don't, that's fine. Well, I can't convince you. Most people, um, I mean, it's different with people who are very new, need a huge amount of explaining because they literally don't have the information. But people who've been sober a long time, they've got all the same information as me. We've read the big book. If they don't buy it, they don't buy it. There's a brilliant story in the big book. It's my favorite one at the moment. Our Southern Friend, where he asks this bloke some questions. This is in the 12th stepping phase. He asks some bloke these questions about recovery. And the bloke gives him the answers, then leaves the room. Amazing. He doesn't sit there trying to convince him. He says, well, if that's the case. Are you willing to go to any lengths? Yes. Well, in that case, all your problems are solved. And he left the room. Amazing. It's so. It's their job. It's not my job to make up their mind for them. It's their job. And if they want, if they want, they don't give it to them. If they don't, that's fine too. Um. What else? Um. I've done a lot of work over the years in the service structure of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, so I, I, I have been a GSR on a number of occasions. I've done lots of roles at intergroup. I've chaired intergroup. I've done public information. I've done half a dozen or more other roles at uh, intergroup. Uh, region level, I've been a secretary of a region, uh, conference delegate. Uh, what else? I was the armed services liaison officer, and I've also worked on... Um, uh, subcommittees to the, the the general service board of Alcoholics Anonymous in in this country, um, and that's important work too. If we don't tell people about AA, they won't know. Uh, I've had the privilege of writing presentations. Uh, which have gone out to literally thousands of professionals that help alcoholics and problem drinkers, very clearly stating out, state, setting out, stating what AA is, what it isn't, what it can do, what it can't do. Um, on days when I've done that sort of work, I don't have any problems. Who would I be to have a problem when I have the privilege to do something like that? Who am I to have a problem? Um, I don't really hold with problems. Um, 
Uh, sometimes people say this this wonderfully depressing thing. I, I love all these little depressing phrases in AA, which is sort of dressed up as spirituality. One of them is, life doesn't stop happening just because you're sober, as though life is some sort of terrible thing. What a terrible thing. It's a wonderful thing. Um, someone said once, uh, you know, aging is, is very difficult. And the answer is, well, uh, you know, what's the alternative it's a lot better than that life is hard compared to what compared to what not existing dying um obviously there are challenges but what challenges are and this is a little bit of practicing as principles and all our, our affairs um uh, a challenge is a situation where I have to be in extra close contact with my higher power in order to ask God on a very consistent basis, show me how to respond to this situation cheerfully, usefully, and kindly. And there is nothing that is worth losing my head over. This is page 133 of the big book, uh, that we uh, take adversity as an opportunity to show others how powerful the higher power is and that's been my it's exactly what i've done when i've i, I sort of missed the horrors but there have been uh, very challenging situations dr paul o said that he didn't really hold with problems um a problem is only a problem if you think there's no solution uh the fact is whatever so-called problem one has People have had it before and have solved it, either through acceptance or action or a combination of the two, which means there is no such thing as a problem. There are only situations where I'm now on the hunt for solutions. But the biggest solution is trusting the higher power. If I trust the higher power, I will eventually find the magic combination of acceptance and action uh, to solve the situation. Uh, one thing, I've been married to someone for uh, a number of years. We've been together for a very long time, 17 years. Um, and my job in that relationship is to be totally accepting and to be of service. Uh, and that's it. When I stay in my lane, everything is fine. If only I stayed in my lane all the time. When I stay in my lane, everything is fine. My job at work is not to make money. Uh, my job is to be useful and to be easy to get along with, to be reliable, to be someone that people don't tremble before they call because they know they're going to get a helpful response. Uh, and if you do that, my experience is people will give you money. Uh, certainly in my case enough to cover my expenses and to give me a prudent reserve in accordance with concept 12 and just one last shout out to the traditions and the concepts the content of my life is usefulness the method is steps 10 and 11 uh, but in getting along with other people all of the principles in the 12 traditions i found immensely helpful and in terms of getting things done in collaboration with other people and dividing up authority and responsibility, making decisions and executing them, the concepts are amazing. So I use the uh, tradition, the, the concepts and the traditions are both really now hardwired into my modus operandi, the way I operate in relationships and operate in any kind of work or collaborative situation. Uh, I haven't found a situation in the last uh, 28 odd years that hasn't been solved by the consistent application of the 12 steps, the 12 traditions and the 12 concepts. And for that, I'm immensely grateful. And with three seconds to go, I'm going to stop. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.